about three weeks ago, I was in my Bible reading, and there was a verse that just began to jump out to me. So I don't really have a whole lot of notes on this one, um, but we are going somewhere with it today. Amen. Um, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, Lord God's faithful, isn't he? Hallelujah. And... Um, you know, the Bible says that God takes all our tears and he puts them in a bottle. I wonder what he's going to do with that. Amen. Maybe we'll just pour it all on the devil and drown him with him. <laughs> just, you know, wouldn't that be cool? Lord, say, okay, Satan, you sit right here, and then we just got a line, you know, it's an eternity long, and we just start pouring them on him. Just... Yes, it's like salt water on a slug, but I don't, I don't want to insult the slug, so. When you read the scriptures, um, the Bible's very clear about this doctrinally, that the, the scripture says that Satan is the prince and the power of the heavenlies. And there are three heavens. One is the atmosphere that's directly over you and I. That would be what we would see on a starry night. And then there's the heavenlies. That's beyond what you and I can see with our naked eye. That's where the devil rules and reigns. And then there's the third heaven, Paul called it paradise. It's a wonderful thing because the first time that you read about paradise was the Garden of Eden. And paradise was a place where there was no sin, there was no sickness, there was no shame. And that re communion between God and his creation was not ever interrupted. There was this, this beautiful access between man and God. And we know that when Adam sinned, that paradise was captured. Because the next time in the Bible that you read about paradise, it says that Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth and he captured paradise. What he was capturing was the relationship and that beautiful domain that you and I could have when the enemy is, is under subjection. And then the scripture says that he took it and he brought it back up to heaven because Paul said, I was in the spirit and I was caught up into heaven, paradise. And so the third heaven is where God lives. There's never been any sin in heaven. The scripture says this, that at the end of time, God will make new heavens and a new earth, which simply means that he's going to restore it back to its original glory, that what he will make will have never had an imprint of sin on it. And so <clears throat> I want you to get this in your spirit because Right now, the Bible says that the devil rules in the heavenlies. He is in a domain between God in heaven and you and I on the earth. <clears throat> of course, we know that with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that as believers, God has given us, he's ordained for us, divine spiritual authority to bind all the powers of darkness. There is not one demon in the earth that a Holy Ghost believer does not have authority over. Yes. Hallelujah. There is nothing, there should be no demon in hell that intimidates you. The reason the enemy comes after strong believers is because he is scared of them. We intimidate him. 
The devil constantly comes after me. Why? Because he doesn't like the way that I preach. He doesn't like some of your prayer lives. He doesn't like your profession of faith. He doesn't like your your stance for God. And so he will come after us. But at the end of the day, in every skirmish, we are the victors. But nowhere does it say pulling up strongholds. It says pulling down strongholds. Why? Because the enemy is in that atmosphere of the heavenlies. It's where he rules and reigns. And a few years ago, I did a message that every good and perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights. And this is why when you begin to demand and claim from God certain things by faith, I've heard people say, well, you know, you just pray it one time and you don't pray it anymore. That's not right. The old, the old saints used to say this, we prayed it through. There are many times when I go to prayer that in the initial stages of prayer beginning to deal with something, I do not feel like I am making any headway. But I will keep after it, and you will keep after it, and eventually, all of a sudden, you will feel a breakthrough in the Spirit. And what happens is you shift over in your anointing to the Spirit realm, and your authority begins to go forth, and you begin to break the powers of darkness and pull down the strongholds of hell. So that atmosphere, that area, that domain is where the devil rules. In the New Testament, really the first time that we see mention of this is the Scripture says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And in that little barn for that teenage girl, begin to give birth and God came forth into the natural realm that you and I live in as flesh and blood. And when Jesus broke into the natural realm, the Bible said that the angels of God left heaven came through into the realm of the heavenlies, back into that first heaven where the stars are, and they begin to sing glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and goodwill to men. In other words, when something divine happens that's going to affect the destiny of humanity, the heavenlies are no match for when God decrees that I'm going to invade his domain because I need to go through it in order to release something into the natural atmosphere that will get a hold of the destiny of mankind. And that night the skies lit up with the angels of the Lord as they begin to sing about and rejoice over the birth of Jesus. And then it said they went back up into heaven. There's not a lot in Scripture about the early life of Jesus. In fact, really from the birth to the first miracle in that, uh, when, when, when he was around 30, there's only really one portion that the New Testament talks about, and it's when he's at the age of 12. And even at the age of 12, Jesus would have graduated at the top of any college. See, you can put God in flesh, but you can't hide him. And here he is. Uh, His parents don't know where he is, but his father knows where he is. 
because he's saying, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? And he is in the temple, hallelujah, and he is going through a discourse with the learned lawyers and scribes of that day, and they are asking him questions. You cannot stump God. There is no question that can be asked today in the earth that God does not have the answer for. There is no problem that he does not have the solution for. There is no walk that you will ever walk that he has not already been there and came back and got a hold of your hand and said, come on, I will lead you through the valley and the shadow of death and you won't die there but you will come out on the other side by the spirit of victory. It ain't over yet in the United States of America. It ain't over yet in the earth. Hallelujah. The earth does not belong to the devil. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is still King of kings and Lord of lords. We do not throw in the towel. We do not lay down and die. We do not give up. We do not bow down to Baal. But we are blood-bought, Holy Ghost, apostolic men and women full of the Holy Ghost uh, who stand on the written word of the Lord. They got Biden, we got Jesus. They got Pelosi, hallelujah, we got the Gospels. They got the Constitution, but we got the Word of the Lord. And it ain't over yet until God says it's over by the power of the Holy Ghost. From the age of 12 to the age of 30, we would call them silent years, 28 years. Jesus is just maturing as a natural man. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. As heaven is watching, God is looking down because the Bible said that eventually God will give his own son. Before Jesus was ever flesh, the scripture says he was the word. In the beginning was the word. Hallelujah. The only reason the word became flesh is because he wanted to connect with fleshly beings. That's you and me. So heaven, I think, is a buzz with the anticipation that Jesus did not come to the earth just so a virgin could have a baby. He did not come to the earth just so he could astound the lawyers and the scribes at the age of 12. He did not come to the earth just so he could make tables and chairs and work in his father's carpentry shop. Those were just simply things that allowed him to get to the timing of God. There is a timing in the heavens that God, it's called a kairos moment. We get locked into chronos, which is minutes and days and hours and all of that and years. But with God, there is no time. He operates off of kairos moments, which simply means that all of a sudden there will be a convergence of everything at the right moment for the hand of God to be revealed in the atmosphere. And when that kairos moment snaps into being, hell is turned upside down. The miraculous is loosed by the power of the Lord. And one day, Jesus is, he's hearing the story about his cousin who's just a few months older than him. Nobody knows the Old Testament better than Jesus. Because as God, he moved on men of old to write it. But even in the natural realm, he understood the prophecies 
that had been uttered out of the Old Testament, out of the mouth of David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and the Psalms. And he's sensing something. Whenever God gets ready to do something that will shake the world, you will always begin to get an inclination in your spirit realm before you will ever see any natural indicators. That's why God is using prophecy in this hour is because the prophetic is always going to declare the opposite of what you're seeing in the natural realm. <clears throat> and Jesus is feeling something. He knows that these prophecies in the scripture are about him and he can feel a stirring and, and something draws him. He says... He's hearing about John that's baptizing. So Jesus walks down the valley for 75 miles and he gets to the Jordan River and there is John and he's baptizing men and women unto repentance and and they're coming out of the waters and, and Jesus, you know, he has been rejected from everybody, even his own family. And that day he's watching this take place and there is this there is this connection in the spirit of what he's seeing because John, the Bible says, is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And, and that day, something drives Jesus and he walks out into the waters and he looks at John and he said, I need you to baptize me. And John said, I'm not worthy because he has already said, Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And Jesus said, Oh, but Scripture needs to be fulfilled and that day a six uh, uh, John the Baptist who's a few months older than Jesus put his hands on God in flesh and buried him in the waters of baptism and in heaven hallelujah something broke a kairos moment broke and the Bible says that God knew hallelujah that Jesus as a man in the earth could not accomplish what he needed to accomplish without anointing. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke. It is not talent. It is not buildings. It's not pedigree. It is not money. But it is the bona fide presence of the Holy Ghost that gets inside of a building that gives you goosebumps. And all of a sudden you can't stop. It's like a fire set up within your bones. Some people shout. Some people run. Some people weep. And some people dance but the anointing will not leave you by yourself Isaiah said this, it is the anointing that destroys the yoke. And the number one reason there is so much bondage in America on humanity is because we have a bunch of dead churches filled with a bunch of gutless pastors that are more interested in money, fame, and name than they are the souls of men. But God, hallelujah, has found some men and women in this hour that are saying, not I, but Christ in me, for I am crucified with Christ. Uh, nevertheless we live, uh, yet not I, uh, but Jesus uh, lives uh, within me. Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. The problem was the Father knew Though he is God in flesh, he is housed in a fleshly tabernacle, that unless he is anointed, he will never accomplish what he's been sent to the earth to do. And the Bible says that when Jesus went down into the waters, that when he came up out, God couldn't help it any longer. And the scripture says in the ESV, I'll read it this, I want to read it to you because I wrote it down. This is a beautiful scripture. It says Mark 1 and 10. And when he came up out of the waters, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open 
and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the next verse says, and a voice came from heaven. God speaking from heaven to Jesus said, you are my beloved son with you. I am well pleased. When it came time for Jesus to be thrust at the age of 30 into his eternal purpose, it could not happen as long as the heavenlies were closed. If you could have saw it in the spirit, the devil and angels, fallen angels, were joining hand that day like a lion, a line of people. And you remember years ago, we used to play this game. Yeah, and, and is that what it was called? You know, and you hold your hands and you take a flying run and try to break through their, the arms. Remember that? Boy, y'all are old. <clears throat> But if you could have saw in the spirit, every demon in hell that was going there was standing in the heavenlies. And they realized, if this man gets anointed, we are in trouble. No wonder there is such an uprising of evil in the earth right now. It's because the enemy knows if there ever is a blood-bought, Holy Ghost, tongue-talking, apostolic church that gets anointed by the power of the Holy Ghost, there is no power, there is no weapon. Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it <laughs> hallelujah in that day anointing took a fly and run out of the throne room bust right through the heavenlies hit the earth and the scripture says he got a hold of the heavenlies and he didn't just break it he tore it Hallelujah. There was a hand of God that began to tear the heavenlies. And when it broke, it was open. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jesus. And the Father said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. It's interesting to me that if you're Pentecostal in America and act crazy like y'all do and preach like I do, <laughs> that we're weird. But you're not weird when you don't have any shirt on, you got your face painted and a big old number on your chest and it's 19 degrees in a football game half drunk and the media says isn't that great seeing that kind of uh, <clears throat> you know affinity for a team I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I've been stored and may right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. How could I want more? <clears throat> well, we will hear nobody praying. 
and no mourning in that land, for there will be no burdens for us to bear. And the saints of all the angels will join in the triumph song. Everybody will be happy over there. Oh, everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. We will shout and we'll sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over there. See, we're not crazy. Hallelujah, we just got the joy of the Lord. Because people get healed of stage four cancer. They get Parkinson's and run across the platform. Hallelujah. We see the power of God. That day, the anointing. You can sit down because you'll probably stand up pretty soon anyway. <laughs> that day, the anointing of God's nature. God on Jesus. Hallelujah. When you get anointed, you get bold. I was trying to to remember. This is what happened when Jesus came out of the waters. He came out of the waters anointed. He has up in this point done no miracles but this is what anointing will do to you <clears throat> the spirit of the Lord is on me what was he talking about a dove like the Holy Spirit set on him he said the Holy Ghost is on me I have been anointed now to preach to heal to deliver and to recover, and to set at liberty, and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Could it be that we have not been successful as a church because we weren't interested in anointing because it makes you look a little bit silly? But I can tell you this, when you get healed of stage four cancer, you won't do this. Thank you, Jesus. I appreciate that. No, sir. You will run. You will shout when your children get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. When they get off of drugs and you see your son, your daughter set free by the power of God. You ain't going to sin and patty cake, but some of you going to do a lap around the building because the joy, the joy of freedom gets in our spirits. When I read this verse that God tore heaven open. It reminded me of the children at Christmas time that have been bugging you for two weeks looking at the presents under the tree. Can I open them? Get up. Is today the day? Mama, can we open tonight? Finally, that Christmas morning or that Christmas Eve, you look at them and say, go ahead. No children saves wrapping paper. <clears throat> Grandma does. Little kids don't. Why? Because they want to get to what's inside with such joy that they just begin to rip. God did not come out of heaven and take a sword and say, well, we're just going to make a nice little incision here so, you know, it can be put back together later. No, sir. The Bible said Jesus, hallelujah, his father could not wait to, to loose another Adam on the earth that was not a failure, that hadn't bowed down to sin. But this was the last Adam full of the nature of God. And the father ripped heaven open and he put an irreparable tear in it. In the spirit realm, 
I can tell you that there is a rendering getting ready to take place over the earth. I've told you this, that in the history of the earth for the last 6,000 years, never in the history of the earth or the world has there ever been a hand of Satan that at one time has locked down every nation on the planet. There have been plagues that have affected Europe or South America. There have been moves of God that touch certain areas. But the Bible says prophetically that in the last days, the glory of God shall be known throughout the earth. So the enemy has went after every nation not because of politics, that's his weapon. It's because of the glory of God that will be released in the earth. <clears throat> we just happen to be blessed enough to be able to perhaps be on the forefront of what God's doing in the United States of America. But I can tell you this, hallelujah, we haven't even begun to taste of what we're getting ready to see by the power and of the glory of the Lord. When Jesus came up out of the waters and he was anointed, he had authority then. He could look at lepers, be clean. He could look at a man that had never seen and, and speak a word and eyeballs and, and the iris and the pupil and everything instantly is created. And not only does he see, but God downloads into his brain the understanding of what he has seen. He doesn't know what colors are. He doesn't know who this person is. He doesn't know what a river and a tree looks like. But when God heals and does a miracle, not only did he give him eyesight, he gave him the understanding of what he was seeing. There is an eyesight, saith the Lord, that is beginning to be released in the spirit realm. But with it, hear me, saith God, I am also now beginning to release an understanding in the spirit. And I am equipping my sons and daughters in this hour with divine strategy that before the enemy can ever perform his duties against you uh, you will also have already performed an answer and created a delusion against the enemy that will destroy them by the power of God so many people are wondering about well you know maybe God's worried The Bible says this about Stephen, that he preached a message that was so profound and it was so right that they couldn't refute him. So they picked up stones out of intense hatred. Hell always hates truth. And they begin to stone him Large rocks begin to hit him in the face and bones begin to break and his blood begin to flow and skull fractures and, and his orbits were cracked. And as he's beginning to sink to the ground in death, the Bible said that God opened the heavens. And he looked up with blood running in his eyes. He said, oh, I see Jesus. Standing. Now, what's amazing is Ephesians says he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. But Stephen had faith that made even Jesus stand up. When you can make Jesus stand up with your faith, hallelujah, angels start looking at each other and going, Now, that's, I never seen him do that before. <clears throat> Can I tell you, hallelujah, I got a feeling that Jesus is beginning to stand up for the faith that is being delivered unto the saints. Why are we in war? Because we are earnestly contending for the faith that once 
one time has been delivered unto you and I. You have authority. You are anointed. You don't have to go to Bible school. You don't have to memorize the Bible. But if you know him, hallelujah, who is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, you have the God-given right to look hell in the eye and say in the name of Jesus, I bind you up by the authority of the Holy Ghost and every knee shall bow to the name of Jesus. And what Stephen saw was not chaos. There was order in heaven. Because even when one of God's precious servants was being murdered, heaven was at peace. For fear not he who can kill the body, but fear him who can kill both the body and the soul. And Stephen just went on into the presence of the Lord because God opened the heavens. Now, for three and a half years approximately, Jesus walked the earth under anointing, the Bible says, that was without measure. I mean, my God, we don't really comprehend some of the stuff he did. If you've ever been to Israel and you've ever seen the Sea of Galilee, you know, people have never been there, you think of... That's a little lake. No, it's, I think it's 13 miles long. It's something like six miles wide. It, it, it's, it's big. So the waves that can come up on that thing were like waves that were on an ocean. And yet Jesus, this guy was so amazing that even when he was sleepy, he could look at a storm and say, peace, be still. And they laid down like a puppy dog. <laughs> Leprosy was incurable. Guys, part of their fingers are falling off and, and noses and, and, and appendages are, are rotting off. And Jesus looked at them and says, be thou clean. And before they ever got to the priest, they're just whole. Dead people are being raised. That's what anointing does. That's why I can't watch Christian television hardly. Right. Right. So you need to lighten up on them. Well, I don't know about that. God, give us some on fire people. Listen, anointing doesn't mean that you have to preach like I preach. Anointing's not volume, it's not how loud you talk, it is authority. And there are tremendous men and women of God who don't hardly raise their voice, but there is this authority that comes out of them in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I've cast demons out of people because I believe in deliverance. So did Jesus. Cast demons out of people all the time. Demons don't intimidate me. I've got a hold of people that were demon possessed and they'd start bucking and snorting and start trying to talk and I just look up and say in the name of Jesus shut up <laughs> just, just come down quiet cast that spirit out why because you and I have authority over demons behold I give you power over all the power I give you authority is what it translates as over all the dunamis of the enemy <clears throat> So Jesus, I'm, I'm going to speed up here. So Jesus gets to the end of his ministry. And what he has been doing is he has been preparing a church, a body for himself, a bride. Because he knows that I can't stay here. And when I leave here, my purpose ain't leaving with me but it's going to stay here in the body that I am raising up. <clears throat> the problem is 
is that the authority that everyone had at that time was a delegated authority from Jesus. The disciples were very bold as long as Jesus was in eyesight. They felt safe with him. But the moment Jesus was taken away from them, every one of them denied him. Why? Because they were around it, but it wasn't in them. And the mystery of the ages is Christ in us. Hallelujah, the hope of glory. I see in the spirit six and seven year old children laying hands on people and casting out demons by the power of the Holy Ghost. The Lord says this last move of the Lord is going to be so different from what you thought. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God said it will not be defined by time. It will not be defined by location, says the Lord, but it will be defined by the abiding presence of the Spirit of God. There will be times, says the Lord, at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, there will still be buildings full, saith God, of crowds that are beholding the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ. For I am removing, says the Lord right now, out of the church that which has been counterfeit and that which has not been me. And know this, saith the Lord, there is even a physical death getting ready to hit this nation for those who have shunned me and willingly stood and counterfeited and took the anointing and put it on flesh, says God and know this that this year will be the greatest year that you have ever beheld and by the time this year is over saith the Lord we will not remember the political upheaval for the glory that I'm getting ready to release in the spirit will make you forget politics and make you forget that which has been done unto thee for I have heard the cry of my people in this hour and I have come down says the Lord not just to bring you out but to bring you in to the promised land and to the inheritance by the spirit of the power of God. For no one has seen the men and women that I am raising up in this hour, for they have been hid. But now this year, saith the Lord, there is a clarion call. Come forth. And even as Lazarus came out of the tomb when they thought he was gone, so am I raising up men and women that the world thought would not come back. Many of them will have had failures, but they have repented, and I will restore their gifts and their anointing, saith the Lord, in this hour. Shout, says the Lord, for it is not over. I am just getting warmed up, saith God, for this is my hour. The wicked have had their time, but this is the hour of the church, saith the Lord. Now, I want, to, I want to deal a little bit in the end of this message because many of us feel like there are things that we have lost that are gone forever. When Jesus, <clears throat> nobody, even when Jesus was on the earth, the only way that you could get into the presence of God was to physically be around Jesus. Because he was God in flesh. But you could not get into the presence of God Almighty as a human being because every human being had a sin nature and could not be redeemed because there had never been any sinless blood offered that the Father would accept for the sins of mankind. So now, here we have Jesus, and the Bible says that he is the Lamb of God. And he came to the earth for one thing, not to heal lepers, open blind eyes, not to steal the, the Sea of Galilee. His only purpose in the earth was to shed his blood 
as the ultimate sacrifice that heaven would accept and that God would no longer look at you and me as doomed, but he would look at us as redeemed. <clears throat> so here we have Jesus now. God has allowed Satan to set in motion the sacrifice. This shows you that the devil is not omnipotent. He doesn't know everything. If he did, he'd have let Jesus live. Because what he was getting ready to enact and start <clears throat> was the worst mistake that he has ever made and will ever make. And that's when he himself, as Aaron and Moses in the Old Testament would offer the lamb the sin offering. It's so cool how God does this. He said, I'm going to take the devil, who is the origin of sin, and I'm going to make him offer the sacrifice for sin. And the devil don't even know what he's doing. Yeah, <clears throat> and while he's partying, yeah. while they're laughing because they're crucifying Jesus, they're pulling out his beard, they're sticking him with, with uh, spears, blood's coming out the side, and he has been filleted with a whip. He's been spit on by hundreds of soldiers. We don't realize this, but Jesus was covered with phlegm and spit. They were coming by and clearing their throat and just spitting on him. He was hideous to look at. And heaven, hallelujah, knows this is a Kairos moment. And the Father in heaven is like a child at Christmas because his house has been empty. For thousands of years. He has not talked with a man that doesn't have sin in him since the Garden of Eden. He has watched in silence while his creation has been denied access into his presence. And God, hallelujah, long. <clears throat> for children to be in his house. And that day, as it looked like the heavenlies were triumphing, and now this precious, beautiful Lamb of God is being suspended between heaven and earth in great pain. As a man, he said, oh, Father, why have you forsaken me? God is taking hold on, son. And Jesus said, it is finished. And, he went, oh. and the Bible says that the Father got up, reached down through the heavenlies, of the hole that he had ripped when he anointed his son, took his two hands into the holiest of holies where he was, and he got a hold of a veil that was 60 feet long, 30 feet high, and four inches thick that it took 300 priests to take it down and wash it. They said horses hooked to it couldn't pull it apart. And in one moment, God, hallelujah, got a hold of that, which said his children cannot come into his presence. And when he looked over and saw blood on the mercy seat in heaven, he said, they're coming home. And God 
got a hold of that veil four inches thick. And from top to bottom, he began to rip it. There was a sound that began to go forth in glory. And when God got done, he dropped it to the ground. And for the first time, man is looking at the mercy seat. And the God of heaven said, come on in. Let's have a good time together. If any man will come in and sup with me, I will sup with him. Can I tell you by the Spirit? There is a hand of the almighty God that is reaching out of the heavens in this hour. And the Lord is getting ready to rip that which hell has erected and said you cannot go here. And the Lord is saying it is not by might, it is not by power, but it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. Stand with me. This is my final point because it goes so beautifully with a song that Ricky and the Isaacs and Rebecca Howard sang. This is why I know that we're walking into victory. When Jesus came out of the grave, resurrection came out. He wasn't the only one. Because the Bible said that when Jesus, when the resurrection anointing got loose in the atmosphere and Jesus came out of the grave, the Father got a hold of Jerusalem and began to shake it. The Bible said the earth began to shake. And rocks begin to break in two. What was he doing? Graves begin to open. And Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and Abraham and David, hallelujah, the three Hebrew children came up out of the graves and began to walk the city. So hear me, there is a resurrection anointing of the Lord that is loose in the year 2022. And God said, just because it's buried don't mean it's over. It ain't over yet. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And God is loosing in the earth a resurrection anointing by the power of the Holy Ghost. So whatever the enemy has taken from you, I can preach like this today, a week ago or less than that, with my son laying here. Our family, his mother, we watch that. Do you know why I can? Because there's resurrection anointing in the atmosphere. Hallelujah. We do not sorrow as those that sorrow without hope. Why? Because we understand that when Jesus came out of the grave, death has no authority over believers, they just move. And I want to tell you by the Spirit, there are some of you, the enemy has taken your gifts, your hope, your joy, your peace, and buried it. And today, I declare a resurrection. Anointing. It's been so long since some of you have even had prayer where you got over the realm of the spirit and your prayer language got loose and you got happy again and you're not depressed. I loose hallelujah a resurrection anointing upon you today in this building. No more hopelessness. God give us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Hallelujah. Let us see by the spirit that the Lord is tearing open the heavens for you. As my praise team come. <clears throat> hallelujah. Hallelujah. My prayer partners come across the front. I see God right now 
tearing the heavens open. I'm telling you, and when there is an open heaven over a church, over an individual's life, over a nation, it's just blessing. It's the supernatural. It's the miraculous that begins to take place. God, I ask you to anoint the eyes <clears throat> of our church in this building and the ones that watch online around the world right now. God, let us hear the sound of you ripping. God, what the devil has tried to wrap us in, the shroud. Sharabobo soria kitala baba sandai. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> We're all going to come in a moment. But if you believe that God can resurrect something in your life that the enemy took from you, I want you to quickly come out of the balcony, on the floor. I want you to come find a prayer partner because you are in the middle right now of an atmosphere <clears throat> where God, hallelujah, speaketh things that are not as though they were and it says this about him he quickens the dead he makes alive the dead hallelujah hallelujah